Okay. Okay. So welcome everyone. My name is Eden Foley and I'm an associate professor of art here at West Shore Community College. Joining us this evening is Rene Asmagras, our amazing librarian, and artist Philip Hartigan. Philip will be giving an artist talk as a part of West Shore Community College's Humankind series. The Humankind series asks the question, what does it mean to be human? In the last three years, as a part of the series, we have invited scholars, artists, professionals, and more in search of answers to this question. We have looked at large geographies like Africa and the Middle East, and more focused locations such as Cuba. In its fourth year, humankind is looking at the British Isles. The, the locations are picked by West Shore Community College students, faculty, staff, and many members of the broader West Shore community. A little bit on Philip, originally from Great Britain, now based in Chicago, as you can see on uh, his background, uh, Philip Hartigan uh, has ties to Northern Michigan through his teaching at the Interlochen Center for the Arts. His art explores half-remembered, sorry, half-remembered moments from childhood in an English mining town where his grandfather was a coal miner. We had originally planned this to be an exhibition at West Shore Community College's Minier Dawson Gallery. However, due to the pandemic, we are looking at hosting Philip at a, and his artwork at, at our campus gallery at a later time. Um, in this talk, Philip will present his art and talk about his influences. You are more than welcome to pose your questions in the chat and he will be answering them at the end. Philip, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. You, Eden, I am absolutely delighted to be here, if here is the right word, over the internet and Zoom, but uh, yes, delighted to be here, delighted to be taking part in this uh, series of art related to people from the British Isles. And Renee, thank you too for um, providing the assistance for this talk tonight. So, uh, yes, my name is Philip Hardigan. I was born in Britain in 1962. I've lived in Chicago since uh, 2002, thereabouts. So I call Chicago my home. Originally, I was born and lived in England, was raised there, and I've actually lived in a few other places for fairly extended periods of time, between six months and a couple of years in other parts of Europe. Um, and in this talk tonight, I will be giving you some background about my personal history, uh, and how that relates to uh, the growth and development of my work, both in Europe and then the United States. As you can see, by the time we get to looking at images of my work, talking about personal moments of memory from childhood is um, very relevant because that's pretty much what most of my work has been about for the last 10 years. So if you could have slide number one, please. So the area I was born is in the north of England in an, an industrial town called Newcastle upon Tyne. 1962, early 60s. So at that time, the area was still dominated by heavy industry, particularly coal mining, it included steel mills and shipbuilding on the River Tyne, which is the main river that uh, flows through the county there. And this image of a coal mine near Newcastle is actually only about a mile, two miles from the village where I grew up, which was, the village was a collection of maybe a hundred terraced houses, which were built specifically to house the coal miners. And the entire area around there was just surrounded by coal mines. And this photograph may be from the early 20th century, but frankly, when I was growing up and even into the 1970s, when the coal mines began to close down, it really looked very similar to this. Nothing much changed in a, except for, you know, electrical, electric pylons and wires and so forth. Um, and this area north of Newcastle, about 10 miles north of Newcastle, uh, was basically farm country, but it was actually one of the biggest coal mining areas in the whole of Europe. I mean, the coal seams from which they hewed the coal underground to fuel more or less the entire industrial revolution in Britain. I mean, these coal seams were as deep as a mile on the ground and extended beneath the 
bed of the North Sea nearby, all the way out into the North Sea. So it was an incredibly important coal mining area. My father actually died when I was very young. So my mother moved uh, her, my brother and me back to this village from where we were living at the time. And we lived in my grandparents' house for pretty much the rest of my childhood. Um, and it's been said that your future adult personality is shaped by pretty much what happens to you between the age of four and seven, more or less. And that's pr pretty true in my case. Uh, almost all of my early memories are dominated by living in this village, seeing my grandfather, even in his 50s at the time, I guess, when I was born, still coming home from work. We actually didn't even have an indoor plumbing or bathroom. So bath time was essentially a tin bath in front of the coal fire. I mean, something which I believe I've read about in places like Appalachia and Kentucky in the 20th century too. And it can, it's kind of hard to believe that this sort of thing was still going on into the late 1960s, which to somebody like me is still not that long ago. And it's something that could have been going on for you know hundreds of years before. It's kind of wild, really. So we can have slide number two, the next slide, please. So the childhood in a community of working coal miners really did leave a deep impression on me. And it's had an influence on many aspects of my life, and including my art. This is an image of uh, life of work underground in the coal mines. Again, very typical of the area where I grew up. This might be from a little longer ago than the 60s, going back to before World War II. But my grandfather would tell me about this. He would tell me about going to work in the coal mines when he was 14, 13 years old, around about 1920. And he worked as what this, what's called a hewer. These were the guys with the pickaxes and the shovels who went crawled through the coal seams to hew the coal directly out of the coal face. And then it would be thrown into wagons and drawn by pit ponies, they were called. Ponies who spent their entire lives on the ground Kind of harsh to say that, but true. And then they would haul it to the mine shafts where it would be taken uh, above ground. So at the time, as I say, when I was a kid, my grandfather was still working in the coal mines. He was, I guess, 56 years old when I was born. And he first went down to the coal mine, as I say, when he was 14 years old. Next slide, please. Again, this is not my grandfather, but this image of a man working at the coal face on the ground is pretty much exactly how my grandfather would have worked for 20, 30 years of his life, beginning when he was a teenager. You can see how dirty and um, it's how, what dirty work it is, what incredibly hard physical manual labor it is. And as you can see by these photos, coal mining has always been a, a dirty, grimy and dangerous job. And it was even more dangerous back then, back um, in the first half of the last century. And in fact, one of the mines in the area where I grew up um, was the site of one of the worst mining disasters in British history. I think more than 200 miners were trapped underground and killed, only recovered the bodies a few days later. And then in 1940, my grandfather actually was buried alive by a roof collapse. So imagine working like this, where we see this chap now, and then the entire roof collapses. It would happen quite often for various reasons. But luckily for him, he was pulled out um, eventually and did make a recovery. Uh, but, just, but understand this, he actually had a broken back, it broke his spine, and he was told that he would never walk again, that he'd be paralyzed for the rest of his life. And in fact, the other day I was talking to my mother again about this and she told me that I'd forgotten this or I didn't know that another guy who was buried at the same time as him, in fact, was also paralyzed, had his spine snapped and he never did walk again. But miraculously or not, my grandfather actually did make the determination that he would walk again. And after about a year of physical therapy and trying his damnedest, he actually did walk again. Next slide, please. And here he is, my grandfather. He's the guy hoisting his brother above his head. This photograph was actually taken by the local newspaper at the time. This would be in the 1940s. So in fact, Britain was at war fighting the Nazis at the time. 
coal miners were considered to be a protected class, so they weren't called up to join the army. Anyway, my grandfather had nearly died in an accident the year before. He told he would never walk again, but here he is hoisting his brother over his head to prove that he indeed was recovered, recovered his strength. And I believe this news photograph was taken by the local newspaper at the time under the title Miracle Man. So, kind of impressive. It's clear from the way I'm talking about it that my grandfather was a big influence on me. From what I've just told you, it's pretty obvious that he was a tough man. And in fact, that toughness came not just from, you know, working on the ground and the way that tends to toughen you up hard in your body. He was, um, I believe he was even a bare knuckle boxer too, like an amateur boxer, did it for, I guess, fun, if you can believe that, or for money. Um, so I grew up surrounded by all these men and women of the coal mines and all these personal stories, some of them perhaps embellished a bit, but, but that's part of my life that um, eventually I did begin to explore in my art. After a long gap, it has to be said, but uh, as I will show you in, in a while. So it's clear that I never did follow my grandfather and my uncles and even some of the people I was at school with down to work into the coal mines. I sort of took another path and that was afforded me through education. And here's one thing I know about the place I grew up. I mean, despite the dangers and the hardship of their jobs and the, that kind of fierce community spirit that is created around it. I mean, most people wonder no illusion about um, the dangers of such a job and that if any avenue of doing something else opened for their children, they were more than happy for them, grandchildren in my case, more than happy for them to take it. So by the time I reached my mid-teens, it turned out I did have an aptitude for study, particularly uh, in art and literature. So education was kind of the path that led me out of the coal mines and the coal mining towns of England and into the wider world. So my undergraduate degree was actually in English literature, not art. As it happens, I was lucky enough to win a scholarship to Cambridge University, which is located, as you may know, in the south of England, not far from London. So although I didn't realize it at the time, I, when I left home at 18 and 19 to go to college, that really was me leaving home forever, except for family visits and brief trips back after that. And a few years after graduating from Cambridge, the, um, the visual arts really began to pull me again. And I was accepted into a postgraduate program, a fine arts program at an art college in the south of England. And that included a year in um, Barcelona, Spain. Next slide, please. So this is me in Barcelona. That's me at the bottom of the photograph in, let me see. I think it's near the port of Barcelona. I don't know if you've, any, any of you have ever been to Barcelona, but there's the famous avenue, the Ramblas, which goes from the port all the way through, sort of more or less north through the city. And, uh, so that meant living there for a year uh, as part of my art studies. Uh, it gave me a studio and a building um, about 100 yards from the Mediterranean Sea and uh, an apartment in the old quarter. Um, and it was really pretty great to live there in, uh, you know, one of the oldest and most beautiful cities in Europe. But equally important, it really did give me the time to devote to painting and to thinking about establishing myself as an artist too. Whatever form that would take, however, that could happen, yes. Now the work I made at art school was basically big, semi-abstract oil paintings that looked uh, a lot like dark, muddy fields, frankly. I actually don't have any photos of them anymore, but they were definitely influenced by uh, a German artist, Anselm Kiefer, and British artists like uh, Leon Kossoff, who are kind of known for their really heavy, thick brushwork. There's one of the sirens from Lakeshore Drive, which is where I'm uh, zooming from at the moment. Next slide, please. So this is in fact a picture of Anselm Kiefer standing in front of one of his paintings. 
and the paintings I were, was making in Barcelona and then back in England at the time were you know, not that different either in content and scale from, um, from paintings like this. And at the time I wasn't even aware of it, but it seems obvious to me now that I was subconsciously remembering this industrial landscape that I grew up in and in making these paintings that, that it was like a, maybe a high horizon line at the top and then a dense, clotted, very muddy, as I say, um, collections of paint on the canvas below. And after art school, when I was living in London, I also began printmaking with a master printer who actually lived in Paris for a while and once worked in Picasso's printmaking studio. So this is mainly classic copper plate etching. And the prints I began under my teacher's influence, uh, my teacher's guidance, show a, a strong influence of Picasso's aquatints of the 1930s onwards. I think copper plate etching is kind of highly technical and um, think, I'm not necessarily going to explain terms like aquatint and so forth, but it basically means how to create dark tones on prints. So if you look at the next slide, please. On the left, we see one of Picasso's etchings from the 1930s, which I knew and loved long before I started taking up etching myself. And then on the right is one of the etchings I made with um, in a series that I did working with that teacher of mine. So not making any comparisons of content perhaps, but um, technically, stylistically, you can, well, even in content, technically, stylistically, I think you can see the, the influence, the similarity there, the exploration of light and dark tones and the etching medium, and then this sort of grouping of figures in a, my series is actually based on uh, one chapter from a novel by James Joyce, Ulysses, but there are kind of semi-mythical aspects to the storytelling in that, which when I came to explore it in printmaking, sort of Picasso's way of myth-making and his work kind of fed into that a little bit too. But in fact, printmaking began to obsess me so much in London that I pretty much gave up painting after that for quite a long time and really explored other ways of making art. So at this point, we're coming to the point, um, the time where I moved to the United States. So perhaps it's time to say something about nationality and how this relates to one's art, to my art particularly. Everybody is born somewhere. So there's no question that your intellectual landscape is influenced by the, the country where you were raised. In my case, the education I received was well, left me with an admiration for the art and literature of England and the British Isles. The, you know, I, I feel that that heritage is, you know, I share with a lot of English people, the, the poetry of Shakespeare and William Blake and Wordsworth, Keats, novels of Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, and the great landscapes of the 19th century English painter Turner, and the paintings of London by 20th century artists like Frank Auerbach and Leon Kossoff, who I've also mentioned. But at the same time, both through my degree programs and through my own reading, I, I was aware of my attachment to the art and literature of other countries. It so it happens for various reasons. I've lived all over Western Europe, beginning in Germany for a while when my parents were there. I lived in Spain for a total of nearly two years, France for a while, Holland for a few months, Next slide, please. So this is just a collage of some of those places that I've lived or spent time in via teaching for pretty much at least six months at a time. So by the time I left art school, having lived in many of these places and went on to live in a few more, I really thought of myself as a European artist as, as much as a British artist. So this sense of, well, it's mixed sense of identity, I think a lot of us can identify with. In my case, it's very much about geography rather than perhaps um, ethnicity, let's say. Although that can be debated, of course. But anyway, I moved around a lot and it left me feeling that, you know, I was part British, 
but I was also connected to these other countries that I lived in and felt something in common with those cultures too. So that definitely played a part in my moving to the USA in 2002. And then I was already familiar with living outside England. The specific reason that I came here was that I was um, about to spend a couple of months on an artist residency program in, first of all, in the USA and um, in Vermont in New England. And then immediately after that uh, in Canada and Newfoundland. And I met somebody while I was there. It wasn't, wasn't the plan, but it's just the way it happened. I, I met somebody, fell in love, and after two years of you know, transatlantic dating, decided to get married. And it was easier for me to move from London to Chicago than the other way around. So at the time, I didn't know how long my wife and I would remain in the USA. And in fact, I do travel back regularly to Europe to teach and to visit my mum and what few relatives I have left there. But in fact, I really did quickly come to feel at home in the USA. You know, I, now I have many friends here. I've, I've had opportunities to travel all over the country and find work here. And plus, I would say that the opportunities to show and sell one's work as an artist, I find, are actually much greater here than they are in the UK. So that brings me to my next uh, point, my next uh, point of discussion, which is my current art practice. So note that I use that term practice, by the way, which I'll, I'll discuss what that means, at least to me later. So a little over 10 years ago, after about six years of living in the USA, I, yeah, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is one of the works I made a little over 10 years ago here in the United States. So about 10 years ago, I was invited to submit a proposal to a gallery to create an installation piece. And not really thinking about what it was gonna be or what, really knowing what it was gonna be. My wife, Patty, who's a writer and a teacher, but a lot of her writing deals with memoir and talking about personal history. So she really encouraged me to maybe try thinking about using these stories that she now knew from my childhood and mining towns and so forth, my grandfather, and to see whether I could make some art or begin to make some art that was cited much more, rooted much more in my own personal interior life experience rather than um, looking outside and creating images that come from the outside world. So I started to think about this and what came to mind was, you know, a mixture of kind of single still images those kind of flashes of memory that we all get about our childhood, which in my case would be the machinery of the coal mines that I showed you in that very first slide, you know, um, winding wheels for, to drop the cages up and down the mine shafts and chimneys and factories and mountains of waste coal that were piled up at the edges of the villages to just kind of for, for storage. Um, but then not just single moments, but also incidents and moments of things happening, such as these half mythical stories about my grandfather, which I've already talked about. So as well as sketching out ideas visually, I began to write things down, to write some of these moments more fully and sort of tell them in pieces that were like journal entries or perhaps you might call them flash fiction now actually, flash nonfiction. And then I also moved about the same time I was preparing for this show to a new studio in Chicago and I decided to try turning some of these moments of memory into stop motion animations. Now I've always loved the art form, particularly the really old and very strange stop motion animations of the silent era. There's, um, so Eastern Europe for some reason, Czechoslovakia as it was then, and Hungary, I believe, Poland, were, um, there's a two or three really fascinating uh, filmmakers from the 1920s, early 1920s in the silent era, who made these really weird and interesting stop motions from um, taxidermed, you know, when you take a dead animal and you do taxidermy on it? Well, you, there's one particularly, can't remember the guy's name, maybe I'll get that in the chat later. Who, as I say, seeing these as a kid actually on British TV because of weird things they showed on British TV back then. 
uh, you know, had a really deep effect on me. And, and in fact, stop motion animation was a real part of British TV children's entertainment in the 60s and early 70s when I was growing up. So this slightly jerky, not entirely polished, maybe childlike or childish form of stop motion animation seemed to me a, a really good way for me to try and express these memories of my own in a way that had a visual art component while simultaneously telling a story. So this image we're looking at now is a still image from the first long stop motion I made. Although in fact I had started a little bit earlier with a series of very short ones, like maybe one or two minutes long, sort of animating single figures, little, um, uh, what would you call them, plastic models, figurines and other objects. And then with a the voiceover telling this moment of memory. And then the stop motion animations that form this exhibition, this online exhibition for West Shore Community College, which you can see on the website, were the one, longest ones I did between six and 10 minutes each. So this one we're looking at here, this still image is, um, was inspired by memories of playground games. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, there's images of children pretending to be airplanes. That's the title of the piece. You know, when you play that game in a schoolyard where you pick your arms up behind you and zoom around pretending to be flying a plane. So there's kind of those images in this stop motion. There's, as you can see from this still image, lots of imagery, well, uh, animated uh, tools and machinery and chimneys and like a conveyor belt and so forth. And then the bare metal boxes, there are uh, these, are these um, clay images, clay figures of two boxes hammering at each other, that refers to this uh, story of my grandfather being a bionicle boxer, which I told you about earlier. And then technically, these were just a great way, these films are a great way for me to employ skills I already had and try to discover some new ones. So constructing the sets and the backgrounds and the models that all involved um, painting and printmaking and drawing, sculpture really, you know, constructing things, gluing things, putting them together. And then the filming part really made me learn new things about lighting and how to set up the camera and the laborious process of making a stop motion by moving the model every model a tiny bit and then you take one still photo and then you move things again another still photo and if like in this still this scene there i think there was something like 25 separate moving parts so every single one of those had to be moved a little bit each time still photo you know we, it, it can all be done digitally these days you know we have um ottoman animations with sean the sheep and all of that there's wonderful uh, stop motions but it's all done more or less by the same process. Even if you have digital aids, you have to take one photo for every movement of a model and then run it all through editing software to create the illusion of motion. So I kind of learned how to do that too, to a certain extent. And for your information, it's said that you need about between 24 and 34 frames, 30 frames per second to create the illusion of smooth motion. So for example, to get one second of footage that way, you have to take 30 still shots and then run them all together. And I was actually using between 15 and 20 frames per second. So that's a lot fewer really. And I was kind of happy and satisfied with the, the slightly jerky look that I created because it kind of, as I say, fit into this uh, memory of, um, the kind of that thing that memory does when you remember your childhood, nothing's quite perfect, maybe nothing's quite exact. But nevertheless, it's still a huge amount of work even to shoot at uh, 15 frames a second. I mean, just to give you an outline, this particular stop motion animation, I think it took me about two weeks to do the sets, six weeks to do the shoot, and then another two weeks to, um, no, I think it took a week to reshoot a scene when I, edited it in the software and realized that my thumb was in every single damn photo. 
and then about another month to edit it all together. Right? And this is for a six minute film and then the second film on the website is a, a 10 minute film. So that took a lot longer as you might imagine. So next slide please. And this one is, yeah, so this is the camera setup of me filming, I think the second one, um, a history of coal. So this set wasn't quite built yet. This was doing like test shots and so forth, but that kind of gives you an idea of the, the setup. It got a little bit more complicated as I built up the set, but again, that gives you an idea. And the second film on this that you will see on the online show was um, A History of Coal was shown at Corner Gallery in Chicago four years ago, five years ago. And then as part of an installation at uh, Terrain Exhibitions in Oak Park. Next slide, please. So these, this is a collage of photos from that installation. You can't actually see the video screen, but uh, this one was called Coal Town. And in addition to uh, showing on a loop the, the video online stop motion animation, there was a diorama, see that in the bottom right, comprising figures which represented my grandfather. And then there were all the bits of machinery that I had from the stop motion sets. I stuck batteries and, um, you know, little battery operated uh, machinery actually in the models to make them appear as if they were moving, or to actually literally make things move. And then this particular stop motion was based on that accident that my grandfather suffered when he broke his back and then recovered. Halfway through the film or towards the end, you see an angel fluttering down and uh, communing with him. So that angel is um, Saint Barbara, who I don't know if you know is the patron saint of miners among other professions. And also it does relate to the fact that I've been told my grandfather did actually have visions pretty much all his life, often underground, but almost always at night, again, right until his, you know, his death when he was in his seventies. Uh, night visions of angels and other celestial visitations, which quite often would keep him up at night and even prevent him from going to sleep. So there's this kind of interesting, I don't know, supernatural part of his legend that I'm quite interested in too. So this installation and the stop motion animation that was also part of it was actually the last one I've made, at least so far. Um, I mean, although you're using visual art skills in making a stop motion animation, and in my opinion, visual art is still, you know, still visual art that is, is still very distinct from film. Film is not one single image, like a painting or a print or even a sculpture for that matter. You know, the, the object is sits still and it's we who move around it. Whereas a film is a series of images that unfold in time, right? It starts at minute one and then it takes however many minutes or hours before the story and the piece is finished. So even without sound, even in the silent era, right? Um, film implies story, I think. And then with the addition of voiceover, sound, or in my case, just voiceover on top of these stop motions, it kind of reinforces that storytelling element. Or well, something I noticed uh, rewatching mine, little stop motions and hearing responses from other people, is that the, um, the narration in these stop motions kind of diverges sometimes from what you're seeing. So they don't quite overlap exactly. It's not like the narration is describing or directly illustrating what you're seeing. And that kind of sets up a interesting uh, tension, I think, between the visual and the, the oral, the, the herd, again, which makes a more indirect and oblique narrative element to the whole thing. So after I stopped, or took a pause making stop motion animations, uh, the same images that were part of that process began to come back into the other forms of visual art that I would work, work in. Next slide, please. So here's a copper plate etching from a few years ago. 
And what do we see? There's a figure lying on the ground at the bottom there. Uh, in my mind, and I think it might be clear to other people too that it's can relate to my grandfather underground lying with uh, you know the coal on top of him. We have these uh, machine-like things, factory-like things behind him, and then these hills that again hills of coal, hills of my childhood that I remember. But as so often happens with visual art of any kind, I mean, the act of drawing or painting the image in your head leads to something changing on the page or on the canvas once you actually get into the process of making it. Now, for example, I began to remember crows as I was making these prints particularly. I don't think I have a crow print, but crows started to come into these images. Uh, why? Because I, when I think of birds in my childhood, I think of black crows sitting on um, the fences next to the fields in winter, or on the bare branches of trees, or on the, the roof of the local church, the spire of the church. I mean, a lot of my childhood is smoke and factory and mist and fog and rain, because that's the part of England it is. And crows just seem to come to mind when I think of birds from that time too. But then also it turns out my grandfather uh, was a poacher, right? So part of being a coal miner or a working class person, and particularly the 1930s, which is the Depression era, as you know, they wouldn't necessarily have uh, a full larder all the time. So to supplement the, uh, the food, he and his brother would uh, hop on a motorbike and go up into Northumberland, which is the big rural county surrounding Newcastle, and uh, poach for game and birds and rabbits illegally on private land. Um, so I think of him as a, somebody trying to catch or poach birds too. So I have this image of birds that began to creep back into the visual art I was making and, and then these hands trying to grab the birds. And then the more I paint these shapes, I unconsciously start to see them kind of as abstract shapes too. When I saw the new canvas, I try to think of ways of moving these shapes in different combinations around the canvas, yes, while still theoretically uh, starting with an inspiration that is based on a childhood memory. So, uh, next slide, please. So this is a painting of me in my studio just last year. I mean, I include me there in the photo just to give you a sense of the scale of some of these paintings. I'm doing smaller ones, but Work on a bit. I have been working on a series of larger ones like this, five feet high and some six feet wide. And I hope you can see by the the way the brush strokes appear on the canvas there that when I try to work on a painting, I try to, or when I work on a painting, I try to treat it as just a big drawing, right? So that means that the way I move my hand when I'm drawing or with charcoal or pencil on a page gets translated onto the canvas. So if I'm drawing with charcoal, I tend to make shapes by approaching it with lots of different marks and then the marks accumulate and get very overlaid and until eventually a shape or figure emerges. So I try to do that with uh, the paintbrush too. It's also a way of convincing me that I'm not doing a big painting in the style of, you know, the, or in the tradition of oil painting, which stretches back, you know, six, 700 years. So sometimes for some artists, the, the whole weight of that tradition can kind of weigh on you, the whole history of oil painting. So it kind of stop you from moving ahead or even creating something. When you have that thought in your head that says, well, you know, if I'm going to do this oil painting and this scale, it better be as good as Rembrandt or Goya, or I'm just not going to start, right? So for me, that's a process, and I know this works for other artists too, of beginning with a drawing, and then when something starts going in the drawing, you take it to the canvas and just keep that motion of the arm and the, the paintbrush going. You see what I mean by that in the next slide, please. Yeah. 
So the title I've settled on for this series is Bird Catcher. This particular canvas is four feet high, five feet wide. Actually, I think I've got that wrong. It's five feet high and six feet wide. And in the close-ups, you can see what I mean about that drawing style, using a brush to draw like a charcoal, a piece of charcoal. This actually was taken just before I finished it. So there are, uh, the final version has the, what appears to be the shape of two arms coming up to try and grab the bird. And that's quite common in most of the paintings in this series. So this is probably what I meant earlier when I talked about the practice of painting. So the way that I was taught and the way I work now is that art, particularly painting, doesn't arrive by just seeing an image in your head seeing it whole in your mind and then once you start painting or drawing you're just kind of copying down what you see in your head so when you make the painting or drawing you you try to make the creation of a work of art uh, a process a bit like a job you know a thing that you do every day or as often as you can so you're there and you just repeat the gestures repeat the marks the movements of your hand in your arm as you can see in these repeated diagonal strokes or horizontal strokes. You're just building things up, whether it's mixing the paints or you know making the mark on the canvas, building these marks up or just sitting on the chair and looking at the piece for a long time. I mean, all of this is part of your practice, yes? The repetition. And that enables you to be in a position to be receptive when something changes in the piece so that an image starts to emerge that looks different from what you first imagined. I hope this is all making sense just to me, but I'm hoping it makes sense to you. Um, and actually, I usually hope that that happens during the process of making a painting, that you start with something and then just by moving the hand and moving the arm and playing with colors and shapes, that changes a little. It often means a lot of overpainting too, not necessarily scraping off, but you know, just, okay, that looks like that particular angle needs to be moved up a bit or moved down a bit. Perhaps if somebody wants me to explain that process, I'll try, although it's a little bit more difficult. The reason why it would look better in one position than another, I guess there are reasons. But so it's a long process of figuring things out on the canvas once you get going, to put it in a nutshell. I mean, as it said, it's been said quite often before, and it's probably true, I think, that you make a work of art not to confirm what you already know about something, about yourself or the light, your life or, or the image in your head, but to discover new things, right? Whether it's about your own process or your own way of making something or the subject matter. New combinations of color or, for you, forms and patterns, because I think that sense of discovery, if you feel it and you're, it, it does tend to transfer to the canvas. We're just talking about painting in this case, but it, whatever artistic visual medium you use, you want your viewers, the people who are looking at the piece eventually to feel that sense of discovery too, and not necessarily feel that they're just looking at something they've seen exactly before. Next slide, please. So after a long absence from painting, which lasted for well over 10 years, I would say, I mean, trying every now and then and realizing, okay, it's not really coming together, going back to etching, making films. I've arrived at a point where I do feel able to start saying something in the medium again. And what you see in the paintings, these paintings here may only be vaguely related to the more direct storytelling or narrative elements of the stop motion animations. But I do see them as absolutely related in my own mind to the, um, the content of those films. And I know I could not have got to this current work if I hadn't made those films in the first place. I mean, painting is by now a pretty old fashioned way of making art compared to even my crude short films. But again, you can't worry about that too much. Uh, I still make work in other media and may indeed make a stop motion film again if it seems like it's the right thing to do for the story or image that I'm trying to tell at any one time. 
I mean, I know that whatever medium I use, that for the foreseeable future, the material will still be related to those moments from my childhood, 4,000, 4,500 miles away in the British Isles. So that things that happened decades ago back there uh, are now being remembered, will continue to be remembered and be recreated here in the United States. So that effectively concludes my talk, my um, journey, use a popular word, from, from there to here. Thank you, Philip. You're welcome. That, um, sorry. Um, for the audience, the, um, the last images that you saw, um, those are uh, going to be the ones that we're hoping to bring to um, Minier Dawson Gallery to present. Uh, the pictures do not do justice. Um, you know, I, I don't mean to criticize your photography. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the pieces are are stunningly layered and and um, just stunningly beautiful. They they sort of captivate you, and they're very large. You know, five foot tall, six feet in width. Um, so yes, post post COVID, hopefully sometime in you know foreseeable near future, we'll have them here at the um, at the gallery. Um, That'd be wonderful. So there's a couple of comments. Um, if there are any um, questions, um, please type them into the, uh, the chat box and we'll... Um, yes, the, uh, the not, uh, stop motion pieces are indeed viewable online at uh, the Humankind uh, main website, uh, Humankind West uh, WCSS, I'm um, sorry, uh, scc.org. Uh, um, and you can see those, um, so most of you came through that um, link on Facebook. And thank you, Rene. Um, and you can see the two uh, videos there. So in lieu of having the exhibition at the gallery, that's our sort of uh, temporary band-aid to it until we can bridge um, that time period and we can have these magnificent pieces here at the gallery. Yeah. You're, so, you're so kind, Eden. Thank you so much. So what have we got in the chat bar here? Okay, I see friends of mine. That's nice to see you all again, folks. I actually can't see you, but it's nice to see your names on the chat bar anyway. <laughs> yes, perennial question I get is, are they ravens rather than crows? Of course, who knows? But to me, they're crows, right? So they're black and crowish. So, <laughs> yeah. What artists have influenced my work most, asks. Ken Rogers, hi Ken, who is the same Ken I'm thinking about. I mentioned a few earlier, um, British artists such as Leon Kossoff and uh, Frank Auerbach. Um, artists who were known for painting street scenes, uh, the urban landscape of London. This would be in the, from between the 1930s to the 1960s, 70s perhaps. So impasto, you know, which is very heavy, a layering of paint to the point where sometimes the paint standing an inch, two inches off the canvas. Um, so very gestural, very um, sort of big shapes, not represent, well, they represent change in the sense that you can see that it's bridges, churches, uh, the rooftops, but uh, they sort of hover between an image of something and then just big abstract lumps of paint on the canvas here. So I was kind of influenced definitely by that way of using paint when I was younger. I'd say more recent influence is um, an American painter called Susan Rothenberg. For several reasons, that kind of um, drawing style of single brush strokes um, where you can see the what am I trying to say? Imagine taking a piece of charcoal and scribbling with charcoal. So that happens in paint. So it's stylistically, I've definitely learned something from her. Plus also she was, her first breakthrough series of paintings in the 1970s was uh, of horses actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of treatment of an animal 
in a semi-abstract way, I guess, is kind of in, in my head somewhere. Although I have to say I've tried not to look too much at Susan Rothenberg lately because <laughs> it, it could, <laughs> it, I could just end up doing nothing but pastiches of Rothenberg if I let myself, so I have to be wary of that, but um, that's a different uh, influence. Who else? I mean, those are pretty good ones. And then, you know, there's the usual childhood influences when you, uh, when you first learn about art and go to art colleges. But, um, but yeah, and here's another one I just thought of today. Um, George Brack, I hope everybody knows who he is, the, um, the Cubist painter who was um, companion of Picasso in uh, developing Cubism in Paris, early 20th century. But he kind of stayed with uh, adapt, an adapted Cubist style towards the end of his life. And a lot of his late paintings feature birds treated in a Cubist manner, semi-Cubist manner. And I, it's only dawned on me now that that way of using a bird shape as a sort of an, almost an abstract element is, again, I think that must be in there somewhere. So, um. so there's an interesting question um, regarding your education at Cambridge. Um, could you talk to that a little bit? Um, the question is about quotas from the North. Um, and um, could you talk to the importance of that, um, both for um, you and for, obviously, for um, Britain? Well, for me, it's, um, let me see. OK, yeah, right, I see what Karen's asking. Yes. Um, I mean, I come from a very working class background. Cambridge and Oxford are, as you probably know, are two of the most elite universities in the world. I'm not saying that just to show off, but you know, there are consequences for that, right? For people who um, come from outside a certain class in England, a country which certainly when I was young, still really, but when I was young, was still very much dominated by the traditional class system of people being defined by their socioeconomic status. Upper class, aristocrats, landowners, the queen, the so-called middle classes, which in England are definitely the, the judges, the lawyers, the professionals, different mean to what it different to what it means here. And the working classes are the people who really are, you know, um, working the machinery, um, driving the buses and digging the coal. And the 20th century was really when you started to get more movement upward mobility from the working class into these bastions of elite culture like the universities, uh, the elite universities. So when I won this scholarship, this would be the early 1980s, it was not unheard of for working class people by any means to be at the university. But I was the first person in my school to even go to university. So that's not quite true. I was actually part of a group of four or five peers of mine who don't know how it happened, but we all went to university at the same time. And we were the first people to ever go to university from that particular school in that area. I was the first person to go to Cambridge from that particular class of people in that area too. This is a long winded way of answering this question. <laughs> but let me just say that when I got to Cambridge, it was a culture shock. I really wanted to go there. I wanted to, you know, take advantage of the opportunity offered to me. But, you know, I, I, it took me first year to actually get past the snobbery that would accompany my heavy working class accent. I've pretty much lost that now. But when I was young, I really did have an extremely strong uh, dialect accent. And I even had people, it was an experience when during the, my first seminar with a professor at Cambridge, being the sort of place it is, you have a seminar, two people at a time, maximum. So your class size is two, can you believe it? And the person, and the other person in my seminar group, this other person was from a you know, rather well-off background. And the teacher, professor was too. I started answering a question and the prep professor turns to the other student and says, I'm sorry, I can't understand the word he's saying. Do you think you'd be able to translate for me? So that's, <laughs> that's kind of the experience I had oh, in Cambridge when I first went there. So I pretty soon learned how to lose my accent a bit and adapt mm. it. So let me just answer specifically Karen's question. 
yeah, I mean, I'm, things got a lot better. I've made lifelong friends who are still my closest friends. Um, but it's definitely, I would say that experience is definitely of an era now. I know that in the last 20 years, the percentage of people from working class backgrounds who go to those universities is a lot higher. So, um, yeah, that kind of classic tale of the working class boy who gets yanked out of the coal mines, more or less, almost, into the elite world of the university is, yeah, much more common place now than it was back then. So I hope that answers that question. Folks, do we have any more questions? My, my eyes are really bad, Eden, so could you actually read the, uh, <laughs> could you read the question? Well, the question is, when you, uh, when you were growing up, did you, uh, did they show the, the Rankin Bass holiday specials in the UK? Thought of those when you were talking about some of your, not, uh, your stop motion work. I wondered if these had influence on your work. Um, I can't quite remember what they are, so I don't know. Rudolph. Oh, yes, 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 absolutely. I know exactly what you mean as soon as you say that. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. That sort of thing. You can picture the slight jerkiness of the, um, the motion there. Yes. <laughs> good, uh, good call, whoever said that. Yeah. Mike. All right. <laughs> yes, um, I'm trying to remember. I mean, Eden, I know, has a, shares a English background with me too. I'm trying to think if you remember any of these things, British TV, when you were a kid, Eden. Me? Yeah. No, no, I had very little interaction with in with British TV. Oh, okay. I thought you did. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. You missed so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the garbage that is now. Yeah, well, I don't know. I haven't seen it in a while, so... <laughs> Is there anything you think I left out, Eden? Is there any question you'd like to ask? Um, no, I'm actually, I just want to really encourage everyone to go and see the videos if you already haven't, so the animation pieces. They are really stunning. Um, one has sound, one does not have sound. Um, and you can actually follow the trail once you go to the, uh, the videos are embedded into the website, which means that when you click on it, it will take you to YouTube. Um, and you can follow that trail to see some of Philip's work, um, some of the videos that he's uh, published of himself working, um, developing some work, um, developing various fragments of, of work. So if you're really interested in diving into some of the um, gestural stuff that Philip was talking about in his um, um, presentation, you, you can actually see him in action. Um, and I do encourage you to watch the, um, the, the videos. They, they are really fascinating, two really fascinating um, animation pieces. Very inspiring, very, very inspiring. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful to do this, take part in it. Um, and I always like sharing those stop motions too. The, um, you know, they're a, a real summary of a particular kind of work and a, as well as the, um, the inauguration of the whole path that I'm still following now. So the um, even if I never made another one, they'd be extremely important to my you know, development as an artist. Um, uh, Philip, there's one last question that came through um, about the etching process and how it's changed over the years with um, chemical, uh, more friendlier chemical processes. Because um, when you were talking about it, all I could sort of smell in, in sort of my memories is, uh, is being in the etching studio. Yeah, yeah. Right. And we would always get bleach and acids on our clothes and rip. <laughs> and I hated it. Right. I absolutely hated it. But have, has has that changed? It depends on which studio you go to. I, I actually took the opportunity to learn non-toxic versions of these mm -hmm. processes about ten years ago. So there, there are certain things you can't substitute. You can, but. So ferric chloride, the thing that you actually etch copper plates in, which is actually mildly toxic. It's not, if you get it on your hands, it doesn't really burn for at least a couple of minutes, you know. But a lot of the other really nasty 
carcinogenic chemicals, because that's what they are. They're carcinogenic if you allow them to be absorbed into your skin too much. Yeah. Yes, I've achieved great results with replacing many of those traditional nasty chemicals with um, acrylic-based materials, essentially. So yes, it can be done. And in fact, the etching I showed you in this slide earlier was done entirely with non-toxic materials, apart from the ferric chloride. So, and I so guess yes, I it is possible. Yeah. yeah so, um, I, and I guess I didn't know this. Um, someone commented that um, the books that you make, one is, which is at the Chicago Art Institute. That is true. Um, two of them, actually. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I've been making artists' books as part of the series of installations and the, the particular books I'm talking about had the same kind of coal-based imagery. So, um, you know, the textures and colors and imagery of machinery, mining, and so forth, with a word here and there drawn from the stop motion animations. And there's a collection, and there's the Joan Flash Artists Book Collection at the... Okay, there. Yeah, the, well, it's the School of the Art Institute, actually, but it's still part of the toot, still part of the Art Institute's collection. So, yeah, um, Curator bought two of my books to put in that collection a couple of years ago. So, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Thank you, Ken. Quite proud of that. <laughs> yes, quite proud of that. <laughs> so, if you go to the Art Institute's book collection and ask from, you know, look in the catalog for my name. They will, the guy in the white gloves will bring the books out of the thing to show you. So yeah, that's kind of fun. Yes, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> so one last question. Um, also, they're asking you to comment on your portable printmaking and teaching capabilities. So it sounds like somebody's doing a plug for my classes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> It's in the Q and A. It's been posted to the Q and A. Right. Well, yes. I mean, um, there's a Michigan connection here. Um, I've taught regular classes in Michigan for more than ten years in the, the Interlock and Arts Academy. Uh, some of them for the um, the teenage students there, but for about ten years, they've also been running um, programs for adults that are uh, site specific. Uh, what's it called? A purpose built. Uh, building on the Interlochen campus, uh, Interlochen Arts Academy for what, if you don't know, everybody in Michigan, I think, knows what it is, right? It's way up there in the beautiful north woods, northern Michigan, near Traverse City. So yes, I have a little portable printing press, which I haul up there uh, every now and then to teach printmaking classes. Uh, I haven't taught etching there, but lots of other, you know, monoprinting, relief, woodcut, collage, collagraph. Um, well, that's good to keep in mind. Uh, so when you come up here, maybe we'll have a yeah. workshop. And in fact, I have in another place near here in Wisconsin, I have actually taught an etching class hmm. with um, with the ferric chloride. So that was fun. <laughs> and my little printing press in tow. So yes, thank you for whoever asked that question and got me to you know, plug for future employment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight. Um, thank you. And I mean, I'm glad we've been able to um, band-aid it with a this, this Zoom um, presentation. Uh, but I, I look forward to the very near future when we can actually show your work in our gallery. Um, I, I'm really excited about that. Thank you, Reed, and thank you, Renee, for helping out tonight. It's great to talk to you. And again, my deep appreciation, thanks to West Shore Community College for including me in this series, which by the way, will be ongoing through the rest of the year, yes? Yeah, yep. So there will be, I, I look forward to seeing the work by the other artists too. Yes, um, there's a couple of events coming up. The next one I think is uh, Claire Ashley um, okay. on the 20th of October. Okay, great. Great. So, thank you and good night everyone. Yeah, thank you everybody who joined us. See you online or in person soon. Yes. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye.